Welcome back to part two. Let's add some animation to our edge noise shader to complete the previous challenge. Edit the subgraph. And as I mentioned in the hint, you probably want to delete the original vector one cutoff and instead replace it with a vector two. Delete both the node and the property. If you right click over the node, you can just disconnect all if you want to see what other nodes are affected. That's optional. We just need to delete this node. Right click over the property and delete that as well. We'll get a warning prompt. What we're doing will affect other graphs in our project, and that's okay. We'll fix that later, so say yes. And then add a vector two to the blackboard. And we can still name it cutoff, but this time cutoff will represent a whole range of values. This vector two will define the min and max of that range. I've played with this already, and something in between 0.1 and 0.9 looks okay. So we just want some kind of range of motion in between zero and one somewhere. Let's make a little bit of space and I'll roll up this preview. And for the simple harmonic motion, we'll need a time node and a sine node and a multiply node to control the speed. First for the time, let's create a node, input basic time. And now let's add a math basic multiply connect those. We want to add a sine wave after that. So math, trigonometry, sine, then we'll add that. The multiply will just control the speed of the sine wave. Right now we're multiplying by the hard-coded default of 2, but we'd rather expose a property in the blackboard. So we'll add a vector 1, and we'll just call it frequency. I'm not sure what default frequency will work. So let's just try 0 0.5. Drag that into the graph, and then we'll pop that into the multiply. All right, and now our sine wave can be controlled by our frequency property. And that's going to be the basis of our motion, just a simple sine wave. We want to relate this to the cutoff min and max that we just defined in the blackboard. And let's do that using a remap node. I hope you remember that one. Math range, remap, and let's connect our sine wave to the import. The in min max should stay at negative one and one because that matches the range of the sine wave. And then we'll map that wave to the cutoff values with the out min and max. So drag the cutoff into the graph and then just connect that into the out min max port. So that means that whenever the sine wave is at negative one, we're gonna map this to 0.1. And whenever the sine wave is at 1, we're going to map this to 0.9. And that gives us some smooth, simple motion that cycles forever. The output of the remap node will hook into the nodes that had our original cutoff values. So connect this to the add node and to the bottom step node. And you can start seeing the edge noise start crawling around in the preview thumbnail when I do that. The output of the remap is always changing and feeding into the step nodes, and the result is some constantly moving noise. And that basically is the main thrust of our challenge. This introduces some simple harmonic motion into our edge noise, and now the shader isn't so static. Now before we leave this subgraph, one other thing that we want to do while we're in here is just make the texture 2D asset a property. So convert that to property. And we can just call it texture or something like that. And that's really all we need to do in here. Save the edge noise subgraph asset and then go back to the editor. And let's double click the temp shader graph to edit that. You'll see that our subgraph node in here has some new input ports and our old vector one cutoff is broken. We were warned about that. So let's just delete the old cutoff node and the property and we're gonna to have to set up the properties again. And yes, this is safe to delete. I'll make some space and we'll need to drop in a bunch of properties so they can be visible in the inspector. Our cutoff is now a vector two, so we'll need one of those. And let's default the values to 0.1 and 0.9. Drop that into the graph and then connect it. And let's just make a bunch of these properties add a vector two and call this tiling and we'll default that to one and one and another vector two 
and let's name that offset and we'll leave that at zero zero and a vector one that we'll call frequency and this will default to 0 0.5 again we can just tweak these default values later if we're not sure about them drop these three properties into the graph and then connect them into their respective ports drag and connect drag and connect and let's tidy up a bit now we're probably not going to swap textures at this point so we can just leave that last input port alone save the asset and now our challenge should essentially be complete let's see our handiwork in the editor you can either go to play mode or preview animated materials in your scene view so just click on this picture icon above the window and then find the drop down just make sure that animated materials is checked and now you can see the noise crawling over the surface of our sphere select the sphere in the hierarchy and then you can tweak the settings for the material so you can change the thickness the cutoff the frequency as well as the tiling and offset now at this point it's just a matter of exploring what the shader can do maybe the frequency can be a little bit faster let's dial that to one and the cutoff determines the range of the motion if you want to keep it more subtle you can dial it between say 0.1 and 0.5 and that's not too bad but just feel free to experiment there isn't really a right or wrong here as long as you like the look that you're going after now you might want to shift the tiling or the offset that's up to you that will give you a different section of the texture in the camera view i suggest that you pause the video just test this out for yourself what these parameters can do now once you're satisfied with the look of your sizzling noise go ahead and resume and we'll take a look at our original force field shader graph it's been a while since we poked around this particular shader graph I've spatially reorganized some of the nodes, but otherwise it's unchanged. Let's do a little bit of past due bookkeeping while we're in here though. I'll switch the default rim color to what we've been using in the editor, just so our preview matches a little bit more closely what we're doing there. And let's make that a nice HDR red. We don't have any post-processing in here, but that's close enough. And let me rename this property to rim pulse speed so it's more obvious that it belongs together with the other ones that are modifying the rim glow. If related properties aren't grouped together in the blackboard, now is the time to do that. This is the order that they will appear in the inspector. As your graph grows in size, it will be more important for you to be organized. Imagine if you handed this shader graph to someone else, you wanna make it as self-explanatory as possible. I've clustered the nodes in the workspace so it's more obvious what part of the graph is associated with what. For instance, these nodes control the Fresnel rim glow. These nodes determine the moving scan line. And these nodes set up the fill texture, that repeating pattern of hex tiles. We multiply the scan line texture by the fill texture right here. We then add that to the rim glow and get this. Then you pump that directly into the alpha of the PBR master, and that determines what's opaque or transparent. And finally, we multiply this same texture by a color to go into the PBR emission to make our glowing shader. We want our edge noise subgraph to go somewhere around here. It will have its own color property and we'll combine it with the rest of the force field's color. And then we'll pass that into the emission channel. Make a little room in here if you need it. And let's disconnect the original line to the emission port. import an edge noise subgraph node. Again, it should be tucked in this group, which should say subgraphs, but it's currently blank. Its preview thumbnail shows the default texture animation that we just created. And we probably wanna color it with a color node and a multiply per usual. Connect our edge noise subgraph into the first input, and then add a color property to the blackboard. This we can call edge noise color, Pick a nice blue for the electricity, something like that. And our mode should be in HDR. And then we can pump up the HDR intensity and then drop that into the graph. Connect our subgraph into the multiply node. And then you'll see some blue sparkles in the preview thumbnail. And then we want to add the output to the rest of the force field. And we'll use a math basic add node here. 
just connect everything up and you can see our little blue noise appear in the preview. Pump that into the emission port of the PBR master and you should be able to see it better in the master preview window up top. And that gives us the electrical noise on top of the force field. And essentially that's our effect. Now, before we leave here, we do need to add a number of properties to the Blackboard, one for each input port of that edge noise subgraph. So we'll just speed through this since it's pretty boilerplate. I'll preface each property with edge noise to group them together by name. And first we'll add a vector two edge noise tiling, default that to one and one. Vector two edge noise offset, and let's keep that at a default of zero, zero. Let's add a vector one for edge noise thickness. And I think 0 0.05 works pretty well for the default from my testing. And our edge noise cutoff is a vector two now. We'll use a default min and max of 0 0.1 and 0 0.9. 0 0.1 and 0 0.9. And then we'll add a vector one edge noise frequency and I think I'll default this to one this time. It looked a little bit better when I used a faster value. And we'll need a texture 2D property for the edge noise texture as well. And let's just browse for the default seamless electrical texture as a default texture. All right, so take a moment and fill all those in. Once you have everything set up in the Blackboard, drag the properties into the graph and verify that each one is connected properly to its respective port. Drag and connect, drag and connect, and after everything is done, it should look like this. Just make sure you hook them up without mixing up the ports or else you'll get some unexpected results. Now, once you have all these connected, make sure you tidy up and keep your nodes organized. All these go together, so I'll just group them visually like this. Okay, so pause the video if you need to catch up. Now, once you have your nodes all created and hooked up, save the shader graph and let's check out our shader in action. Select the sphere in the hierarchy and switch the material back to using the force field shader graph in the shader dropdown. And hey, look at that. That shows us the force field with the extra blue electrical noise. It's faint, but it's in there. You may want to increase the edge noise thickness a little bit if you can't see it. And let's turn up the frequency so the motion is a little bit faster. Adjust anything in here to change the look of the noise. You can dial the range of the edge noise cutoff. Just play with these numbers and see what they do. Or simply shift the tiling and offset of the noise pattern. And that will move our noise pattern in the texture space along the surface. Don't be afraid to pump up the intensity of the HDR color as well. If you're using a really thin setting for the edge noise thickness, then you should be able to crank this up without blowing out the whole scene. And I may turn down the thickness once I turn the intensity back up. And now you can get something like this. And here are the settings that I used. With the HDR intensity set to about seven and a half, we have some really nice trace strands of electricity. And again, you'll have to experiment with these settings to see what works for you. For a further challenge, use a different edge noise texture to create the effect. Either choose one of the other noise textures included in the resources or supply your own. But remember, it looks best if the texture is seamless and tileable. Otherwise, a visible border in the texture might break the illusion. Just a warning, you can spend countless hours trying different combinations here, but that's okay. The more time you spend with the shader graph tools, the more intuitive this will become. If you make something interesting, by all means, we'd love to see it. Feel free to post a YouTube link in the Q&A forums. The forum, after all, is a great place to learn from each other and exchange ideas. And there are so many variations just with all these textures that somebody may inspire you with a combination that you hadn't thought of. Okay, well, I suggest that you pause for a moment and spend some more time doing some shader tests. When you're ready to finish off the lecture, unpause, and I'll give you a few more tips and tricks. Welcome back. Hope you made something awesome with a different texture. 
I imported the noise 8 pattern from the resources and then used that as my edge noise texture. And the result sort of looks like this. And that's quite a different feel. It's rounder and softer, a bit more organic, a little bit less like electricity. And it's not quite my style, but it's different. Now with all these settings, one thing that you do want to take advantage of is Unity's material preset window. If you click on this icon, it will bring up a small window where you can save your material settings. When you have something promising, it doesn't hurt to save the material settings as a preset. Click Save Current To, and I'll call mine Force Field A.Preset or something like that. And then if you muck around and change your settings and lose your work, you can always go back to the preset window, double click your preset, and your save settings will be restored to normal. Another thing that you can try if you haven't already is to use the same texture that you're using for the fill texture. In this case, I can use the same hex tile pattern in here, set the edge noise tiling and offset parameters so they match the fills, and that lines up the two textures. And then you can get something like this. Your edge noise really resonates with the original fill texture, and that makes for a neat combination. The fuzzy edge noise alternating with the scan line kind of play off each other. And of course, you can change the colors, make the edge noise warmer and yellow, and your force field will buzz like a real honeycomb. And you can make a whole bunch of different looks just from a few permutations on what we've done already. The only limiting factor with this is your supply of textures and creativity. So burn as much time as you want RDing the look of your shader. It's all time well spent. Learning is really about doing, and watching videos can only take you so far. You really need to sit down on the box and really just get your hands dirty. Okay, well, we'll end here. All right, until the next one, keep making those shaders.